and I'm going to probably go through it on the side here and then I'll go through it with the drop downs. Just so you can see, like if I were doing this test without having all this like multiple choice stuff, I think because that makes it look like a lot. So let's see what I have here. The average number of accidents is controlled. Oh, sorry. At controlled intersections per year is five. OK. Now um, I'm going to say that when you guys are first reading a problem, you can underline the main ideas, the main, you know, the important parts. You're going to read it at least two to three times because the first time it might just be to get an idea of what's happening. Second time you could pull out the values. Third time you can verify just for practice, especially in the beginning. So the average number of accidents at controlled intersections per year is five. Is this average, uh, this is a question, a different number for intersections with cameras installed? The 51 randomly observed intersections with cameras installed had an average of 5.7 accidents per year and a standard deviation of 1.48. What can be concluded at the 0 0.01 level of significance? Okay. Let's see what I have here. I'm going to read it again. The average number of accidents at controlled intersections per year is five. So this is like for that particular population. In, in general, the average number of accidents at controlled intersections per year is five. Five per year, slow. Um, is this average a different number? OK, that's a claim. That's something I want to test. So I'm going to write my null and my alternative hypothesis. I'm going to ignore this for now, okay? Is this average, okay? Got a claim or something to test about an average. Is it different? If it's different, it's a two-tailed test. It's either not equal to or it's either equal to. Um, is it different for intersections with cameras installed? So is it different than the other population? So this is my comparison. I'm comparing it to the number five. The 51 randomly observed intersections, so I'm taking a sample of 51, randomly observed intersections with cameras. So this is the average with cameras, right? We want to know if that's the same or not the same as the average at controlled intersections. Just so that I remember what that represents. Um, the 51 randomly observed intersections with cameras had an average of blah, 5.7. So this sample had an average. This is a sample mean. The sample had an average of 5.7 accidents per year and the standard deviation was 1.48. That standard deviation came from the sample because this sample had a standard deviation of that. This is S. I don't see anything about a population standard deviation. This is where some people get confused because they see a standard deviation and they think they know sigma. No, this standard deviation comes from the sample, which means sigma is unknown because they don't tell me sigma, which means now I'm changing my situation from testing a claim about a mean where sigma is unknown, t-test or inverse t, depending on what I want. OK, I'll come back to this. I'll find the critical value, too, even though this doesn't ask me for that. So be careful when you're reading your problem. If it's a word problem, just because they give you standard deviation does not mean it's population standard deviation. Does it come from the sample or not? If it comes from the sample, it is S. That's why I stressed how um, knowing the difference between S and Sigma back in the day and you know X bar and mu back in the beginning was so important because now it's very, very significant. What can be concluded at the alpha? So they gave me alpha, my significance level of 0.01 or 1%, right? So they gave me all this stuff. Now I'm gonna just ignore this for a second. I already kind of talked about the fact that if sigma is known, then I'm on a T, right? So I'm gonna use T test or inverse T, and it all depends on what I want. And I'm gonna um I'm going to find everything just because, even though it doesn't ask me, but remember, t test is going to give me test statistic and p value, and inverse t is going to give me the critical value. Okay, so let's do it. 
So go to my TI-84 and I need to input some stuff. Make sure I have that underlined properly. Okay, good. Uh, where's my TI-84? All right, so let's see. I'm gonna go stat over to tests, and this time I want t tests because sigma is unknown. Do I want data or do I want stats? Well, let's see. I have statistical values, so I'm gonna scroll over to stats and then enter. Notice that stats under t tests asks me for sx and not sigma because I don't know sigma, and therefore that's why I'm using t-test. The first thing that I put here has to be whatever the claim is about, which in this case is positive five. My x bar they gave me is 5.7, my sample mean, which represents the average number of accidents per year with, I think, is it cameras? Yeah, with cameras. And this is the standard deviation, 1.48. Um, my n is 51, they gave me that. This is a two-tailed test, so let's highlight the two-tailed test part. Keep going, and then enter. So this is all I need. The only other thing that I might be asked is for a critical value, and you know that's the only other thing that I need to. Um, that's that's the only thing I need to go to inverse t for. Otherwise, I get everything from t tests. Which for this particular problem, that's all I need. But I'm going to go beyond what they ask just for practice. Again, here's my alternative, here's my test statistic, here's my p-value, and then obviously they give me this information. You can compare it to this, or if you had a list of data, you could find those values if you need them. Plug in. All right, so, um, back to my problem. All right, now, I'm gonna come back to this stuff, but just for practice, I'm gonna also find the critical value, okay? Because I always get questions about that. So finding the critical value for this one, just for practice. My, um, my test is a two-tailed test. So I'm gonna have area and two tails. And every time I have a two-tailed test, that means I have two critical values, one on the negative side, one on the positive side. I'm gonna list them over here. Being that sigma is unknown, I'm on a student T distribution, so my critical values are T scores. Let me set up. Now, um, back to these notes, if you forget stuff. On a two-tailed test, two critical values, two rejection regions, and alpha has to be cut in half because alpha represents the area of the rejection region. And since I have two, I have to cut it in half. So let's go back here and cut my alpha in half. So alpha they gave me to be 0.01. And I have to split it into two pieces because I have two areas, 0 0.005. So this area is 0 0.005 and this area is 0 0.005. And this is a rejection region and this is a rejection region. So let's go um, here. If we forget, you got these notes. Go back here. I'm on uh, a claim about a mean where sigma is unknown and I want to find a critical value. I'm going to go to inverse T. Okay, so let's go to inverse T. Inverse anything is found in second and bars. We go there. I told you, um, I think I told you from the beginning, everything for this class is basically stat or second bars, right? So this is second bars. Inverse T is under inverse norm. And it's gonna ask me for area and it's gonna ask me for DF, degrees of freedom, if you recall. Now, being that this is area and it, I, you know, it doesn't ask me the location of the area, it automatically is assuming area to the left. So basically the critical value that we'll get from this is going to be this left one, but it's a symmetric curve. So once I find the one in the left, I automatically find the one in the right. So I'm going to put 0 0.005 for my area. My degrees of freedom come from my n, and my n here was 51. And actually, I'll write that here. My degrees of freedom are always n minus 1, so in this case, 50. And the only time you need to deal with degrees of freedom are when you, you know, are on a t-test or, you know, t-stuff. 
negative 2.67. I'm going to go negative 2.678. So this here is negative 2.678. But I, I have two critical values, so you'll see it like this, 2.678, because it's a two-tailed test. So this is positive 2.67. But I don't have to you know, do inverse T up here due to the fact that it's symmetric. Those two values are the same. So I only do one, and then I get the other. Um, so those are my critical values if I need to know how to find them. Um, this problem doesn't ask me for them, but I'm doing that just for practice. This is not me. I'm ignoring all this. This is me just taking a problem, knowing it's a hypothesis test, analyzing that, finding all the values that I could potentially be asked for, and now I'm going to run the test, and I'm going to look at you know the two methods that I could use to run the test, and then I'm going to put I'll put it all into this if I need to. You don't have to go through this process where you do all this first. You could put it in as you go along, but I'm just going to, I'm doing it this way because, you know, it looks worse like this, I think. Um, so let's talk about the traditional method first, right? Where we want to know where the test statistic is located relative to the critical value, right? And I drew this here too. Um, where is the test statistic relative to the critical value? So my test statistic, where is it here, is 3.37 blah, which is a positive number in the right tail, which is greater than 2.675. So my test statistic is over here in the right tail. Remember, the p-value is that area. Well, half of that area um, is not exactly, right? The p-value is this area plus the little area that would match this on the other side. But my test statistic is here. My test statistic is in, I'll write that here, is within the rejection region, right? It's to the right of the critical value, which means it's in that shaded region called the rejection region. It's in the rejection region, which means, we call it a rejection region for a reason, because if the test statistic is within the rejection region, we reject the null. So that's my conclusion. Now this is just, um, using the traditional method, which is a nice visual method. But they're going to ask me for the p-value method. That's what it looks like. So I'm going to do it that way also. My p-value is equal to 0 0.0014, which is less than my alpha 0 0.01. This is less than 0 0.01, which is alpha, right? And let's go back to my p-value method. My p-value is less than alpha, so we reject the null. So we reject. So we come to the same conclusion either way. I'm doing it both ways just in case, because you could be asked for either way. But obviously, this question is asking for p-value, which is probably using the p-value method. So we know our conclusion. We didn't interpret it yet. I'll come to that when I get to this. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'm running out of time. So I'll interpret it and then. So let's put this stuff in here. Um, all right. So for this study, we should use. Now, the drop down menu here is what? T distribution or Z distribution? Probably, right? And we already determined we are using T. I just want to make sure I use the same exact words T, right? Distribution. Let me just make sure that that's what's in the drop down menu. This is number. Oh, I forgot what number I took this from. Number three. Yeah, Z test for a popula. Oh, it says Z test for a population proportion or T test for a population mean. Well, we're not doing proportion, so T tests, which we know we're using T for population mean. So this is preparing you for next week too. You know hypothesis, you know hypothesis, we already wrote that down. You can input that. I gotta figure out why. What I'm touching make this happen, but make this okay. My null hypothesis we already know because we wrote it over there. Um, I'm gonna leave it for now. I'll fix it later. It is equal to right null always has equal to or something related to oh sorry this drop down is either p or mu i forgot to write that mu right 
and we know that it's equal to this drop down has all the different possibilities less than greater than equal to not equal to we always put the equal to portion on the null five h1 is the same thing as ha the alternative hypothesis which has to be also about mu because that's what we're testing the claim on and we know that this one is a two-tailed test of so not equal to five um we have everything we need the test statistic guys can't see me. <laughs> Panama. You know what? Okay. My test statistic I already determined was from t-test 3.37. Do they say how I, they want me to round? Please show your answer to three decimal places. So this one is telling me how to round. It's a t and it's 3.378. Please round your answer to three decimal places. I always look for that p value four. this is making sense now. This is typically how we round these. We have that 0 0.0014, right? All that was given to me from, from t-test. The p value where we already know is less than alpha. We said that um, and this drop down is probably less than, less than or equal to or greater. So less than or equal to. And then um, based on that, we reject the null. And now let me type up my conclusion real quick because I'm running out of time. My conclusion is to reject the non, so my interpretation is, oh wait, I guess I can look at this. The day, so you have these three options that you have to think about, right? <clears throat> and um, so there's certain things you have to look for because with a two-tailed test, there are different ways that you can interpret. So there are certain things that I'm going to underline. So you see that this varies with is or is not significant. Otherwise, everything, ah, sample mean. The data suggests that the sample mean. No, we're not running a test about a sample mean. It's always population. So I'm going to eliminate. Process of elimination for these. Um, yeah. The data suggests that the population is, is significantly or is not significant. So I'm going to underline this. We have to determine if it is or is not different from five different from five so that is both that is both both of those are dealing with the alternative now my alternative hypothesis is that it's different and i'm rejecting the null if i reject the null then i support the alternative so i'm supporting that it's different so I'm going to say is significantly different right now. This is looking good to me, but I want to verify the end of this because sometimes they have four options where the beginning matches and it's the end that's different. So just verify the rest of it. But this looks like the one from um, five at alphas. They gave me that. So there is statistically significant evidence to conclude that the population mean number of accidents per year at intersections with camera installed is different from five and that matches the fact that we are supporting the alternative. Now I'm running out of time, so let me stop there. Um, do I have time to do this real fast? Um, I'm gonna probably just to kind of Yeah, you have a few of them. Um, so they're talking about the level of significance versus the p-value. Um, I, I want to actually let me write this down because I forgot to put this. Alpha, alpha is equal to the probability of a type one error. And so if I'm talking about this real quick, um, you're gonna find that this part is repetitive and being that it's multiple choice for you, it might just be easy to look for the, um, the repetitive <laughs> nature of it um, just to simplify it for yourself. 
Um, now, there is a 1% chance that the population mean at intersections is different. This does have has nothing to do with a type 1 error. I'm talking about level significance here, right? Type 1 error, reminder, is rejecting the null when it is true. And in this particular case, we did reject the null, so we have a potential type 1 error. So, so let's see which one of these kind of matches the concept of a type 1 error. If the population mean number of accidents per year at intersections with cameras installed is five, and if another 51 sections with cameras installed are observed, then there would be a 1% chance that we would end up falsely concluding that the population mean number of accidents is different. So I'm rejecting the null and supporting the fact that it is different. But if I'm wrong about that, which is the type 1 error, then I'm falsely concluding that this one looks correct. And this is too simple. There's a 1% chance that you get no. <laughs> so please, that's, that's absolutely incorrect. <laughs> um, and then for like p value, this is incorrect because a p-value is not a type 1 error. Cross of elimination. Um, there is a blah percent chance that the population at intersections with camera installed is not. No, p-value doesn't have to do with um, like any kind of probability of um, you know, any of those errors. So it's going to be between the two, between these two, when you guys are determining which one is the correct answer for your p-value. And so, I don't know why they, so what's the difference here? If the population mean number of accidents per year, if the population mean number of accidents, okay, with cameras installed is nothing different. And if another 51 intersections with cameras installed are observed, then there would be a blah percent chance that the that the sample mean for these 51 intersections with cameras installed would either be less than four or greater than. So um, when you're dealing with your p value, you're going to need to look at um, you're going to need to look at because I don't have it up here, but you're going to need to look at your interpretation of the p-value. But between the two of these is going to be this one, um, because technically the p-value is dealing with the area corresponding to your test statistic, which is dealing with like your sample mean and, and calc in, you know um, different interpretation involving that. So, so when I'm looking at the difference between the two of these, you know, if you have to choose one, right? Process of elimination. Um, you know that the p-value corresponds to your test statistic. Okay, you're gonna pick the one that deals with the sample because the test statistic deals with talking about like comparing the sample, right? Which when we come back here, we did that, right? Your st test statistic, your p-values area corresponding to kind of like your sample stuff. But you know, you're gonna have to look into um, interpreting your p-value a little bit more, but you'll see repetition at least for the multiple choice. So it should be easy to choose which one is the correct answer. And you see how I looked at like each sentence and I eliminated it as I went based on what I know um, to expect for each of these scenarios. Um, so let me stop recording. <laughs>